saying to the degree that I wanted people to know that I could rhyme. I really just, it was just something that I like to do with my friends, you know? So uh, after I, I, I finished high school, I wound up going back to New York. And it was a few years before I randomly bumped into Long on the streets of Manhattan. And I had just gotten a crib in the Bronx. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, like he really, he really didn't have a stable situation to kind of lay his head. And I was like, yo, literally, just give me one week to live in my crib and you can come crash with me. And so when he came up to the Bronx, he bought turntables, records, and I, and I was like, yo, you still doing this? You know what I'm saying? Like, because I hadn't done it since I left my man Stan's room. You know, mind you, though, I would always rhyme. Like, I would always kind of put schematics together in my head and what have you. And I would flip whatever was a popular record. I would flip it in, and, you know, like... I used, to, I used to hustle a little bit in flushing, so I might take the words to an LL song or something and just make it pertain to what we were doing. So cats around me always felt like I could rhyme, but it was anything that I was pursuing. Right. So when Long kind of came back, came to New York, I was really kind of just getting out of some trouble, you know what I'm saying? I kind of was, you know, bumping my head thinking that I was supposed to follow my father's footsteps. And it took, you know, took a, look, a couple of bumps and scrapes for me to realize, nah, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. So I wound up hooking up with Long, and Long was like, you know, like, yo, you, you always was nice. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, I'm cool with the natives. And it was kind of ill because I was there when the, the seed was planted for that relationship. We were in Carolina, and um, we, were, we went to a show in Raleigh. Me, my man Stan, who would have been the third black sheep, because it was like his room that we all kind of, you know, spent our time in. And um, and Long, we went to this show in Raleigh, <clears throat> which was about maybe about an hour away from uh, Sanford. And it was uh, the Real Rock Sam versus, Rock, versus Sparky D. And Red Alert came down. He was the, like the MC and, you know, guest DJ of the show. But, you know, like in Carolina, if you're from New York, it's almost like a credit card almost, you know what I'm saying, at the time, you know what I'm saying? So... We was mad cool with the cat that was throwing the event, this cat named Craze. He was from the Bronx. So he knew Long was dumb nice. And he was like, yo, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, we were pushing to get Long up on the stage. He was like, yo, yes, bring Long, you know what I'm saying? So we, and Long's name was Shorty Doo up at the time. And he was so small that he had to stand on milk crates <laughs> to even be able to stand above, over the turntables. Right. So he's literally rocking the arena in Raleigh before the show began. And everyone is bugging because, you know, like he looks like he's 11 years old. Right. But he's massively nice. Wicked, wicked with the cousin, very precise. And so Red sees him and they have a little dialogue and he's like, you know, like Red's like, yo, take my number. You know saying Red, um, Long was like, you know, like I'm in New York every summer, I'm from Brooklyn. So Red's like, take my number. You know, when you come up, give me a call. So that summer, Long reaches out to Red Red introduces him to Mike G, his nephew, and brings him to the Jungle Brothers studio sessions while they're making their first album. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that was the introduction of their relationship. And every summer after that, Long will come up, get up with Red. Red would run him all over New York and have him doing different things. And so, you know, eventually him being cool with the Jungle Brothers gets him cool with De La. Um, when I wind up, when me and him wind up getting together, I didn't really want to introduce him to where I came from. It wasn't for him, you know what I'm saying? And so I want to kind of start hanging out with him a little bit. Like, you know, like, all right, let me see what the studio stuff is about. And so he's introducing me to Jungle. He's introduced me to Daylight. He introduced me to Tribe and what have you. This is before Tribe even has a record. And so, like, Calliope was the name of the studio that everybody was working out. So that became the hangout, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and mind you, like, I was a hustling kid, so... I had jewelry, I had, you know, like they could look at me and tell like, I didn't want nothing from them, you know what I'm saying? So that made it, that made it cool. You know what I'm saying? Whereas it's like, you know, like I'm not here to try to leech off anybody or anything like that. If anything, I, I kind of was there to bring a little flavor to it. You know what I'm saying? Like I was, I was a little bit more of a street kid, even if they didn't realize to the degree because I never flaunted it. But you know, like I'd be in the studio sessions with a pistol and shit like that on me, but I'm not that kind of kid that is trying to do something to anybody. If anything, I'm just trying to make sure nothing's done to me. Right. You know, and so, you know, I was just very street smart, very street savvy. And um, so 
I'm getting cool with the natives and and they're beautiful cats and it was dope because I knew who they were meeting them and I felt honored to be amongst them because of what they represented to me you know what I'm saying like they represented black unity they represented you know knowledge of self they represented a, a black empowerment that I wish still was prevalent you know what I'm saying and I saw how powerful they were and how powerful they I I, I felt like the records they were making I wish that the natives could have become a microcosm of what they were asking the people to be. We never really became that, but that was always my vision for it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm meeting Tribe and all of them, and you know, like I'm so happy, you know, upon the release of their first album, because I was in Calliope hearing it being made. You know what I'm saying? And um, and like I said, like Long was a dumb, dumb, nice DJ, and they all realized that from him coming up over the summers. Long actually did the cuts on Buddy. You know what I'm saying? A little more wow. fat. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, he was that nice. You know what I'm saying? And um, so, you know, like, when Long came to sit with me, he would have maybe five records in this pile, maybe six records in this pile, maybe three records in this pile. And I'm like, you know, like, what, you know, like, you know, like, but these are all separated from all of his other records. And so I'm saying, you know, like, you know, what's these records mean? So he would play me, you know, I want to put this beat with this loop and you know, I'll put this over the top of it, and I could hear it because that was where we came from. We both had a DJ's ear, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, all right, like I'm seeing like this is possible. I'm like, yo, I'm literally in Calliope Studio, damn near every night, hanging out with these dudes. I'm cool with Red Alert now, like you know what I'm saying? Red, I'm ha literally hanging out with Red. Red is running me around all of the clubs, hanging out with him, and, and Red is literally like an uncle to us. And I'm meeting all kinds of cats in the industry. So, you know, like, I'm like, yo, Long, like, you know, like, we should put something together. He's like, yo, we should. Like, you know, like, you're a dope MC. And I'm like, all right, so I'll tell you what. I take him to a pawn shop, I pawn all my jewelry. And right in the pawn shop, I give him half the money. And I'm like, look, all right, so we're partners now. Let's go make a demo. I felt like he put me in a position to, to do something with the demo. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't have a problem with sacrificing that. Right. I, feel, I, I saw the bigger picture. It was, it was blatantly right in front of me. Like, you know, like we could go to the studio and go hang out with Dayla. We could go to the studio and hang out with Red or Jungle Brothers or, you know what I'm saying, or hang out later on tonight, you know what I'm saying? And we're meeting all of these people. And, you know, so we literally take the money and um, we go make a demo. And we keep it between us, you know, we don't tell anybody this and the other, we wait till we finish it. And when we finish it, we probably made about maybe about five or six cassettes of it. Give one to Red, you know, probably give one to each group, yo, check us out. This is, you know, and everybody was blown away, like, oh, snap, like, yo, y'all are dope, this and the other. And um, only song I think that was on the demo that wound up making the first album was Count and Sheep, Try Count and Sheep. Okay. But um, I wish we had put more from the demo on I'm like, like, the demo was dope. And so um, Red makes a, this cat that used to work for Red at the time by the name of Dave Funkenklein, this white cat, makes a few calls on our behalf. And um, you know what I'm saying? And so we get some meetings set up with different labels. So now we got like a week's worth of meetings set up. We go to Def Jam, we go, you know, to Polygram. Um, I think we went to Electra and, you know, a few other labels, what have you. And I remember specifically, like, we wanted to sign with Def Jam because Def Jam was kind of like the holy grail to, especially when we were in Carolina, anything that said Def Jam, we immediately got it. Like, it didn't, we didn't even have to hear it because right. that's how strong the name was. Like, you know, like, it was like, oh, we got to check this out. This is the Def Jam new record, whatever. So, um, oh, and, and one thing I also want to say, there was a couple of MCs that really resonated with me at the time um, before, I, before we got to this point. And I was Just Ice. I remember being down south in Carolina. I loved Just Ice's album. You know what I'm saying? Loved Just Ice's album. Going way back. Yes. Loved that album. I mean, everything on that album. And, and, I, and I tell you why. Like, like, because though you could sense he was a dangerous person, to me, he was massively intelligent. You know what I'm saying? Like, like me coming from where I came from on the street level, 
Like, you know, like I could sense the, the, street, the grittiness in everything about him, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like he was, he was, he was no dummy, you know what I'm saying? Like the way, he, the way he put his words together, he was very sharp. And there was another album that was really big as far as hip hop for me, which was um, the Fearless Four album, you know what I'm saying? And the Fearless Four album, to me, uh, the devastating Tito was dope. Like, like when he, you know, every time, every time he came on, like he just shined to me. So between Tito and Just Ice, those are the cats that really made me want to maybe grab a pen and paper and sit down and write something. You know, what I'm saying like they they were really dope MCs to me. You know, and so uh, so you know, fast forward, we 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 uh we're taking meetings with different labels and um. I remember the Def Jam meeting. I've, I've spoken about it a, a time or two. Um, you know, like when we finally get this Def Jam meeting, you know, like I'm amazed to be walking into Def Jam. Like, you know, like it's I've spun so much of their vinyl, this and the other, and just a huge fan of the company. And we meet Leo. We meet with Leo Cohen. I had no idea who Leo Cohen was. He meant he meant nothing to me. You know, what I'm saying like this is just the white man that you know the meeting got set up with. All right, cool. So. When we walk in the office, he's on the phone and he's making it a point, like he's looking at us and making it a point to talk really loud to let us know how important he is. <laughs> but I'm not digging what he's saying. Like, he, you know, like in his accent, like, oh, fuck Slick Rick. This idea, uh, he can kiss my <laughs> fuck him. This, you know, like, and, you know, like I'm looking, I'm like, what the fuck Slick Rick? Like, you know, like, you know, in my head, I'm like, this nigga is, ugh. Yeah, like, you know, I'm not feeling him, just the energy. But, um, so we sit, I sit the demo on his on his table before he even gets off the phone. And me and Long are literally just standing in front of him. He takes his time, gets off the phone, you know, like, what 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 the fuck do you want? You know, what do you want? And I'm like, yo, you know, Red made a phone call for us to get this meeting with Black Sheep, this that, and the other, you know, we'd like to play our demo. Now let's say it's March. You know, oh fuck. Listen, I'm not gonna be able to listen to this shit till June. <laughs> <laughs> so it's me like, what? Right. I can't listen to this shit till June. You got a problem? I snatched the tape off the desk before he could even touch it. And I'm like, yo, we be signed by June. And we break out. The next day, we at my crib in the Bronx. And uh, phone rings. You know, this is before any cell phone action is happening. So, you know, I pick up the phone. Is this Drees? Is this Drees? <laughs> and I knew immediately who it was, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, I'm bugging, like, you know, how do you even get the number? But, you know, like, yeah, this is Drez. Listen, this is Leo Cohen. I have a limousine on the way to pick you up. We're going to sign you here at Def Jam, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, what? You, yeah, we're going to sign you. I, I, the music, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm hearing good things about you guys. We're going to sign you here at Def Jam. I'm like, yo, have you heard our music? It was a long pause. I hear it's phenomenal. I hear it's great. This <laughs> and this is my word. I'm like, yo, nah, like, like, there's no way I want to. I, I, I so don't dig his energy. And me knowing myself to the degree that I would cut him, like, I was like, <laughs> nah, man. I was like, yo, you can tell that limousine to turn around, man. We good. We, we really good. Like, nah, we good. And you know, like that was the end of the conversation. And um, but. It, it upset me. Like, I was really probably a little over-emotional about the whole Def Jam letting him be the representative. So we wound up signing with Polygram, Mercury. And uh, Dave Gossett and Lisa Cortez, they signed us. And I remember not long after we signed, I'm in a meeting with Dave Gossett. Well, just hanging with Dave Gossett. We're in Atlantic City at a conference. And when I go to the bathroom, and I'm sitting at a long table. And I'm sitting right next to Dave. Now, when I come back from the bathroom, Russell Simmons is sitting in my chair. Wow. It's a long table. I could have sat at any other chair at the table. But I'm so disappointed that this dude has Leo Cohen representing what I think is the holy grail that now I'm mad at him. <laughs> and I wanted him to know who I was. And I probably still pay the price for what I did, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> at this point. Even though he never admitted, I woke up to Russell and I slapped the back of the chair like, yo, get up out of my seat, man. Wow. And he looks at me like shocked, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I'm like, yo, you in my seat. 
is a table full of ch empty chairs. I could have sat anywhere. Right. But it's just the fact that I, <laughs> I wanted him to know who I was, and I'm a little disappointed that he's got Leo Cohen. He gets up and he just walks away. <laughs> I sit down, Dave Gossett, who used to work for him, starts dying laughing. He's like, yo, you are wild. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Right. And probably to this day, like, Russell probably still, like, you know, I fuck dress. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but, you know, I, my life isn't contingent upon other people. You know what I'm saying? And I, 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 I made that decision a long, long time ago that, like, you know, just be myself. Right. And, um, you know, like, would I have done it a little differently today? Yeah, you damn right I would have. Right. But, you know what I'm saying, I was a young cat, you know what I'm saying, and, uh, you know, I wanted him to know who I was, and I'm pretty sure he knows who I am today. But just to say, you know, so, you know, we wound up going on to make this project, and, you know, Wolf and Sheep's Clothing was, has really done well by us. Um, what were some of your best memories of making that debut album? Ah, uh, man, so many dope ones. Um... I did a lot of writing uh, in Washington Square Park, this park in Manhattan downtown. Where you from, bro? Indiana. Okay, cool. I like Indiana. Yeah. So um, this is park downtown Manhattan, and, and this park is called Washington Square Park. And a lot of times, all of the natives would meet there. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was, it was like a hangout for us. But the park was dope. It was a real eclectic mix of people that would be in the park. And it was a cool getaway, you know what I'm saying? And there'd be people singing, playing instruments, comedians. There was this comedian named Charlie Barnett that used to perform there often. He would have a, a tremendous circle around him. And the cat that used to warm up the crowd for him was a young Dave Chappelle. You know what I'm saying? Wow, wow. And, you know, it was like, like, it was that dope. Like, the part was that dope. Like, you know, like, you'd see stuff like this happening all the time. And uh, so I'd sit in the park and I'd, you know, I'd roll a joint and I'd write. You know what I'm saying? Literally, just, you know, right. So I, I wrote a lot of lyrics there. Um, we had cool friends that would come by my crib, you know what I'm saying, in the Bronx, um, Smiley and um, and Malachi. Malachi from um, Group Home. Ah, that's like that's like, that's like, like, like a little brother to me. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, he'd come by my house all the time, all the time, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, we'd just be rhyming for each other, what have you, like, you know, and... You know the sessions at Calliope. The sessions at Calliope were amazing. I wish, I wish somehow we were, had been able to document them, because it was like it didn't matter whose session it was. It could be a daylight session, a tribe session, jungle session, our session. We'd all be there. You know what I'm saying? And one of the things that I learned, you know what I'm saying, in recording the Wolf and Sheep's Clothing was, if I could impress the room. That was my goal. I wasn't really so much thinking about people. I was thinking about my friends in the room because they were hip hop royalty to me. And so my whole thing was like, if they like it, people have got to like it. Like there's, there's no way that people are not going to like it. Right. If they like it. And everyone was real selfless. It, it didn't matter whose session it was. If someone was in the booth rhyming and you could think of a way to say something a little bit, you know, like, Maybe they said it this way, but yo, you thought of, yo, how about if you said it like that? And and if they heard you and they thought it was fly, they'd say it like that. And it didn't have anything. We were all real selfless. We were all just trying to be dope. Right. And we were never caught up in the egotistical aspect of being dope. You know what I'm saying? And we all lended ourselves to whatever we were listening to, whoever session it was. So, you know, so it was dope. It was just really cool and, and really brotherly, you know what I'm saying? Young Beat Nuts was in there. I remember one of Beat Nuts' first sessions. They they used to run around with. I think they used to have a tech in the in the backpack, but they had records in the backpack too. You know what I'm saying? And I remember one of their first sessions. I was sitting in their session with them, and they really were just putting loops together. You know what I'm saying? They didn't really have a concept of of the arrangement. And I remember sitting with them and telling them, like you know, like trying to explain arrangement to them. And literally, you know what I'm saying? Like, they definitely got it like that. They were dope. They had dope loops. They just hadn't gotten to the point yet that they were arranging it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, right. this is the intro. This is the verse, the first verse. First verse going into the hook, the change, you know, coming out of the hook, you know, goes back to what the verse was doing, what have you. So, you know, but that wasn't like for props. We were all friends. You know what I'm saying? They're all trying to see the best out of each other. 
know what I'm saying? But I specifically remember one of their very first sessions in Calliope sitting in there with them. 